Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to our third Women in Business conference. And welcome, Anya Highmarch, who didn't start her business at the um, best average age of 45, but began it when she was 18. Amazing. Obviously, a born entrepreneur, but we'll talk about that more a bit later. Um, Anya has um, had a stellar um, career so far, and it's by no means over. She's got plenty of new ideas. Um, but, you know, she built up this international um, fashion luxury brand um, that just grew and grew in influence. She's been, I can testify to the fact that she's been widely copied by bigger brands, uh, but she has a very successful business. Huge number of shops at one point has scaled back to focus more uh, online and in the UK, but I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to go over to Anya. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, Anya, can we just, you know, go back to how you started? Because I know you've told that story many times, but it bears repeating because it's, it, in some ways, it's quite extraordinary. But I, I think it also shows how when you have a good idea, you just go for it. Well, I think it's interesting. Entrepreneurs often start young, I think. Um, I, I was interested in that stat of 45, uh, and I'm sure that's, the, I know that's not wrong, but I think that um, sometimes um, there's a number of entrepreneurs that start young that sort of slightly as I was probably impatient in the classroom. Um, but also it's interesting to, to remember that when I started, which was back in 87, um, when I was 18, I'm 53 now, that actually it was that sort of moment of, dare I say it, Thatcher's Britain, but there was a sort of sense of momentum for starting business and businesses and being an entrepreneur and that was quite intoxicating actually and it's something that's really important I think we try and get back now. Um, do you see, uh, so, so just say how you did start because you you had that, you were 18, you, had, you, you were in Florence, you saw a nice duffel bag, you got it made. Yes, so I went out um, after school to Italy knowing actually, luckily, that I wanted to start a design business. That was something I wanted to do from and knew I wanted to do from a young age, which is helpful. Um, I then went out to Florence knowing it was the home of leather and wanted to immerse myself in that world um, and saw a bag that sort of all the kind of cool Italian girls are wearing on the street, which was a duffel, drawstring duffel bag. Um, and I found a factory and had some samples made and brought them back to the UK and had a friend of a friend who had a stepmother who was working in the office department of Harper's Bazaar. And I literally knocked on her door uh, with my suitcase of samples. Um, and we ran it in that offer and sold 500. Um, and I never made it to university. I really started from there. So that was the, the very simple beginning. And I think when you're young, it's often probably easier to take those risks, um, which is why I think a lot of entrepreneurs do start um, fairly young. Um, I just want to say at this point, I forgot to say at the beginning, but um, we will be taking questions. And if you want to post them in the chat box at the side, then I, I, what I might do is is go into them as we go along, um, because that 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 might that might be easier with the flow. But we'd love we'd love to hear your questions. Um, Anya, did you did you you didn't want to be a businesswoman? I mean that. That wasn't your first choice, was it? You wanted to be a, an opera singer, didn't you? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> We've known each other too long, Lisa. Uh, you're right, I did. Um, and I, I was very bad at singing and performing. I used to be too nervous, so I, I had to unfortunately ditch that plan. Um, but I I, uh, I had always been interested in, in, in brand and, and what and why fashion uh, is... Um, makes you feel better and it's it's interesting I mean I'm not a frilly fashion person actually and and sort of fashion for fashion's sake is not my sort of starting point for me it's the mood altering aspect of fashion the confidence boosting aspect of fashion the fact that when you feel good uh, you're the best version of yourself you sort of stand that bit taller and you sort of smile with your eyes um, mm. that's a bit that's interesting and I think that you know also my starting point has always been about craftsmanship so I think those things were were interesting to me very early on and, and clearly the opera scene <laughs> career had to become a hobby. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that you say you were too nervous to perform because obviously later on through your career as the as the face of your brand, you, you have had to perform. I think Anya, Anya published a book earlier this year called When in Doubt, Wash Your Hair. And it's, it's a typically jokey, self-deprecating title, but it's, it's a really good book. It's a sort of cross between a business manual, self-help um, and, 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 um, 
you know, girl power, really. But but one of the things you say in there is that, um, you know, confidence is a muscle and you have to exercise it. I don't know at what point you you realized that or whether you some, you know, business guru or a coach told you that. Um, well, it was um, something I think I've learned just um, from, you know, endlessly, you know, you push yourself every day, I think, in, in, you know, in business and, and as women we do. Um, I mean, I wanted to write the book, If In Doubt, Wash Your Hair, because I felt there was so much I'd learned on on the sort of on my way that I wish I'd known earlier. And, and, and often I would do sort of talks to women and always the questions after, you know, what was the best bit of advice? My best bit of advice always was, if in doubt, wash your hair um, for, for lots of reasons, talking in a slightly jokey way about, um, you know, sort of silly quip, but also actually about looking after yourself, but also with that word doubt. And doubt is very interesting as a subject, I think, um, and how we often see doubt as a bad thing. But in fact, doubt is actually something that keeps us good. It channels us and we, we it pushes us a bit. Um, and I think that so often, um, one of the issues I think with women progressing and and you know becoming the, the you know that showing their full potential is really simply about doubt because I think we we haven't had the role models in our lives you know we haven't as we walk into a boardroom we can't say that our mothers and our grandmothers or rarely can we say that our mothers and grandmothers um, had done that before us and therefore this is our place you know we are sort of fighting against the norm uh, and perhaps fighting against um, you know our, our male colleagues who, whose ability is their place so I think we are this this quite interesting transition generation actually and so I wanted to write uh, all the bits and pieces I'd learnt um, and borrowed and stolen and just to put it into a little sort of I hope kind book um, to share the, um, the bits of advice that I that have helped me uh, very openly uh, and honestly, um, and that I wish I'd known earlier. How, how does, um, you know, exercising that confidence muscle, how does that look in practice? I mean, is it about feeling the fear every day? When I think of some of the things you've, you've done, the risks you've taken, for example, being probably the first accessories designer to do catwalk shows, and everybody said, how do you do a catwalk show just with handbags when you've got no clothes to show with them? I mean, that was a big risk. Um, I think you, you know it's, a it's bag. Uh, not no, I am not a plastic bag. That was really quite quite forward thinking at that time. I think it was that two thousand and seven Anya when you mm, launched mm. A, a canvas bag that you sold for ten. But how much did you sell that bag for? Five pounds for five, five pounds. Yeah, I mean it you was, were a large um, brand and you were selling a tote for five pounds uh, through Sainsbury's. <laughs> and then just recently you launched I am a plastic bag counter to everything that everybody has been thinking uh, but made with recycled plastic all these risks that you do um what 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 drives you to take those risks other than obviously thinking this might be good for my business but I think of course yes it's, it's it, <laughs> yeah, they do make me feel a bit sick at times. But we're just doing a big launch today, and I'm feeling a little bit sick right now. Just so everyone knows, uh, it, it doesn't get any easier actually in many senses. But I think you learn to trust yourself. So I think the point is that you know, yes, confidence is a muscle, and yes, um, you know, you follow your dreams, your passions. For me, mm -hmm. that you know, I, I'm interested in fashion with purpose. I, I think it's interesting to use fashion as a platform to to explore different ways of of, of behaving. Fashion is the most powerful uh, viral changer of, of behavior and we can make people wear cigarette pants one minute and loon pants the next you know you can literally change, change the way people um sort of behave um so i like to use that and, and and it is scary at times um but i think that what i have learned and i think that this is sort of what i write about a bit in the book is that if you push yourself sort of five percent not not beyond comfortable because that's a, a horrible place to be and we've all been in that place it's not, it's not fun but if you keep pushing yourself a little bit what you realize is that you can do it. Um, and actually, I, I, I think that my realization is, is you know more than you think. And you just need to learn to trust yourself. And you have this little gremlin of doubt on your shoulder, of course, kind of going, don't mess up, don't mess up, you know, don't say the wrong thing, don't, you know, don't blow it. But actually, it's there to keep you safe. It's a great little sort of insurance check. But turn the volume down. Actually, it's there. You probably won't mess up because we're sensitive people, we, we you know, we're, we're thinking things through very carefully. But we need to actually just just boost ourselves. And the more you you, you take on those challenges that push you yourself 5% further, the more you will, and you will, you will go far, I think. So um, I think we need to really embrace doubt, um, keep it there. It's our, it's our friend, turn the volume down and push ourselves just in incremental steps uh, and to realize our, our potential. 
You, you've never worked for anybody, have you, presumably? If you started your own business at 18, what, how did you learn to be a good boss? What makes a good boss? It's common sense. You know, there's no rocket science in business at all. Business is probably the simplest thing of all. You buy something or make something. You sell it for more than you buy or make it for. It's very, very simple. Um, and you need to, you know, take your team with you. There's, of course, a million hurdles, but ultimately it's as simple as that. Um, and I think that to it, it's, it's the same sort of as a family. You know, you need to explain what your vision is. You need to communicate it. You need to make it fun along the way, uh, celebrate the highs, commiserate the lows. Um, and uh, and you know make it a, a shared uh, exciting kind of game of chess, which is what I think it, it's on a daily basis. Um, I mean, business is fun; it's really fun, um, and it is terrifying. I won't you know I won't pretend anything else. It is terrifying at times. There are certainly those sick moments at three in the morning, but it's all the sweeter for the fact that when it goes well, it's it's so brilliant. So you just have to learn to live a little bit with a sort of constant fear in the pit of your stomach. That is a normal thing, unfortunately. Um, but it's worth it for the surprise that you get for when something goes well. I mean, I think it's interesting what you say about it being common sense. And I think it's also worth pointing out. I have I have sort of been, I've known you for a very long time. I've been aware of you from very, very early on because we've both been around in the business for such a long time. And I know that you've kept, you know, you've kept core members of staff for, for decades. And I think that, that says something about your business style. Um, I also know and, uh, that, that your, your husband is very involved in the business, James. And I wonder what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of that? And, and do you have rules about not talking about it you know, all the time? Um, no, we're useless. We literally, in fact, he bans me from talking about the weekend. But for me, business is, it's not just business. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really fun, as I said, a game of chess. It's a sort of passion. Um, and, uh, and it's lovely. He joined the business when we were expecting our first child together, so 21 years ago. And it's lovely in a way to have that um, that we share. Uh, he would say, I talk about it far too much. I'm sure it's deeply unhealthy, but it's sort of all we've really known, to be honest. Um, um, I, I mean, it's such an all-encompassing thing in my life. Um, and I, I, I love the team I work with. It's, you know, we call it the AH fam. There's, you know, there's, it's hard work, really. Um, but we sort of grow all together doing some really exciting projects that we laugh about a lot, often with big bottles of wine. You know, it's, it's, it's nice. So I think, um, you know, there, it's obviously working with your, your husband or your partner is something you think about quite um, carefully because it's, um, you know, you do need to, you know, be respect, as respectful to your partner as you might be to a colleague. I think that's the one pitfall that... Um, <laughs> you know, um, is, is worth thinking through. But it's, uh, it's for me, it's a real privilege and, and great fun. Um, well, one of the things that I, I picked up from, from the introduction from Claire and Vicky was about um, people saying they enjoy the flexibility of having their own business because my, my, my observations of interviewing many, many very small business um, uh, launches over the years is that it's actually all-encompassing. And I, I wonder whether that's, is it possible, Anya, you've been much, you're, you've had many more shops than you have now. Is there, is, there, is there a way of deciding how big you want your business to be? Or, or does it sort of just take over? I think it takes over, honestly. Um, and I think... I mean, I think flexible working is a fantastic thing. I think it's amazing for family life. And I think it's, um, I mean, I think entrepreneurs work flexibly anyway, because they probably work in the office Monday through Friday and they work all weekend. So, you know, it's always sort of in your mind. So, um, but I, I think um, there's no reason why you couldn't be more flexible. It takes some new ground rules um, and it takes a bit of thinking about. Um, but I think if you have a good team and you're all aligned on what you're trying to do, um, then actually it can work quite quite well and I, I think it's it's completely mad that we're all sitting on the same train at nine o'clock in the morning arriving in the same that's kind of crazy but I also strongly believe in collaboration and actually we're in the office together on sort of core days of Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and those days are exciting days they're days that we really get stuff done so we tend to find people are sort of changing so they do their kind of quiet work their thinking work their interviews their you know, the sort of work that is, is more suited to perhaps um, being at home. And then they do their collaborative work in those three days. Um, but I think that's very, very important. So I, I still really believe in collaboration. Is, is that three days when you all overlap? Is that, is that, a, is that a pandemic lesson? Yes, right it is. So we, we moved from obviously complete remote to then working sort of 
as people wanted actually. So depending on people's risk profile and, and personal situations. Um, and then we actually made a decision to say we would like everyone in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because uh, we have found that collaboration is important to our business. Every business is different. I mean, my kids work completely remotely, or, or some of them do. Um, and, you know, that works for them. So, you know, we're the dinosaurs that are learning, but I still do think we all get a kick out of being together. Uh, and somehow working is a bit easier being together. There's a sort of, you know, it's quite tiring being on Zoom all day, as we all know. I think one of the super interesting things that, that you've done, I mean, contra rather contrarily, is that after the pandemic, instead of, I, I know you grew your, um, your e-tail business enormously, but you then went hell for leather into retail, but direct to consumer retail. Uh, for those who don't know it, Anya has taken over sort of like two blocks of, uh, of Pont Street um in in chelsea chelsea um you opened i think was it five shops there mm, mm, to, we did so yeah to, to, to showcase the different aspects of of your business from the bespoke to the i am a plastic bag uh, there's a cafe there's a well you 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 talk about it and why well, it was, you want to do it, that it's interesting. I think that, um, you know, retail has inevitably been sort of threatened by the internet, you know, rightly, because the internet is brilliant and efficient mm. and, and amazing. Um, and it's forced everyone to really rethink about what retail does and, and its purpose. And um, for us, uh, I felt that actually, if we're going to have retail, it needs to have a reason to exist. There needs to be something that's something you don't get online. The experience needs to be different. So I wanted to open this little, we call it the village, which is um, based around um, the, the location of my first ever store in Pont Street in, in sort of in Chelsea. <laughs> Um, just off Stone Street. And I want to almost make it the sort of the whole world of what we do with a little cafe. So that's a really sort of fun experience. And um, it's almost like a department store with each store being a different department. But I think the point is that it's uh, more experiential. So it's a lovely way to convene with our customers. It means it's very authentic. I, I think that the most stores we ever had was 60 around the world. And I found that I was, I didn't know the girl running the shop in Singapore. We were trying to make window schemes that were the same for LA and New York and, and Malaysia. And it just, it didn't feel very authentic. Whereas now I'm actually in that little village pretty much all the time, meeting customers, fiddling with the windows, but it feels right. It feels exciting. Creatively, it feels very exciting. In addition to that, I think there's a really big movement, uh, well, I feel a big movement towards the word local or localization. Having spent my entire career to the backdrop of the word globalization with global supply chains and global um distribution um and i think that uh there's a real move i think that the next 10 years are going to be so incredibly important um in terms of climate change and what we can do to we have 10 years um so we need to do a lot in the first three or four years um and i'm, I'm probably scared about that i really am and so we are working on a number of projects to hopefully make a bit of a difference but also to really raise awareness and thinking and um, using fashion, as I said before, as a platform to communicate. Um, so also the village gives us a lovely place as a platform to to kind of convene and to have talks and to um, uh, as a sort of platform and subject for subjects that interest us. Um, Anya, we're getting some really great questions coming in, so I'm just going to go to them. Um, there's a question from um, Kiloran Wills. Fear of failure is, in my mind, the biggest issue for women. How can we overcome that? I think. That's so true. I, and of course, and, and by the way, I feel that too. It's terrifying. And it, it's, um, you know, you, you, and it is that point um, of just mm. try not try and chunk it. You know, they do it with dyslexic children, you know, chunk the chunk, the challenges. And actually, don't worry about failure. Worry about, can I do that bit next? And can I do that next? So do it in incremental steps, I think. Um, and you'll realize that failure is often part of success. In fact, it is part of success. I actually think any success is a patchwork of mistakes. That's what success is. So we have to reframe it uh, and, and not be embarrassed about failure. I mean, I failed on so many things. I failed daily on things. Um, and I think we have to accept that as, as just part of, of moving forwards. Um, Anya, I have a question for you, which goes back to my introduction when I said that you've <clears throat> been copied quite a few times by really quite big brands. And well, obviously we are not going to mention any names here, but oh, go on. <clears throat> what's... <laughs> What the telegraph lawyers would have a heart attack. Um, what, because that is a real risk to many small creatives. What, what's your advice? 
Well, you have to work within the law ultimately. So if your idea is defendable, then register it, you know, trademark it, whatever you can do to protect it. And that's expensive. You know, we trademark things all around the world and you're just sinking tens of thousands of pounds into every design that you, you register, you know, in every territory and every category. So it's expensive. But um, try and come up with an idea that is defendable. Uh, and if it isn't, you need to be fast. <laughs> and actually, there's an awful lot of ideas that are not defendable, um, but they are, you know, sort of bedded into their market with great communication and they have very loyal customers and the customers won't necessarily go anywhere else. So I think just lean into it, don't panic, but, um, you know, wherever possible, if you can, if you can actually design something that's defendable, that's the dream, but it, it's not the end of the world if you can't. Um, question from, um, uh, sorry, I've, it's just gone down the list. Where's it gone? It was a really good one. Uh, I, think, I think from somebody called Jessica saying, what, what was the most valuable lesson you learned early on? Um, I think that was... Well, I think that, yeah, I think if you're... I remember saying to my sister, you know, if you're sort of determined enough, you can do anything. And of course, it's a sort of slightly silly, um, silly sort of quote. But I, I do think that actually, if you just don't give up, then you 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 kind of then you get there ultimately it is really almost as simple as that and 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 yet that is not simple because actually when you start a business um you know it's really fun at the beginning you have your new business cards and your new business spangly idea but actually a sort of year or two in it inevitably gets quite hard and that's at the time when many businesses are lost and it's at that point actually where i think you just need to really tell yourself not to give up um and to seek advice from other friends who are starting their own businesses and just surround yourself with people who've hit those brick walls because um, you will hit lots of them and you need to find a way to go over them or around them or indeed through them, which sometimes hurts. <laughs> um, great question from Camilla Upson, which you will know really well how to answer. Um, she has a business with her mom and her sister and it's great, but can also be challenging because she says that all in a different places in their lives and have different availability to put into the business. What advice do you have for different founders being able to input different amounts at different times? I think clarity of communication is really important. So I think having the rigor to try and actually do an org chart, even when you're small and even when you're a family, I think in a, in a family situation, you need more rigor than ever. So actually, I think divide up that, you know, that org chart, who's running it, um, who's part time, who's not part time. Um, so everyone's. What, sorry, yes. organizational chart. So what that means is, you know, who's the boss? Who's in charge of sales? Who's in charge of production? Who's in charge of communication? Rather than everyone do a bit of everything and everyone sort of not be quite clear and treading on each other's toes and some people sort of fitting it around kids and not actually set out the, the, the roles and responsibilities and the commitment. So everyone says, I will commit to this many hours a day and these will be. So actually it's quite clear. And of course you can be flexible with that and say, actually, I'm so sorry and I need to change that. But I think the, the rigor of roles and responsibilities and commitments are even more important important to the family businesses to save arguments. Um, question from Emma Simpson. Are you, are, you, um, are you able to share specifically one or two of the key doubts that you experienced in your career and how you responded to them? Yes. I mean, gosh, where to start? So many. Um, I think, you know, there's the creative doubt, which is, you know, is this idea a good one? And there's a, there's a brilliant, um, uh, it's called the creative uh, dip actually and in fact, i talk about a lot of, in the book where you start going i love this idea it's amazing and then you get into it and it gets a bit difficult and it doesn't reach the budget and then it gets really hard and you start hating it and then you really hate it and then you get to the bottom of the dip when you hate yourself that's when i hit the wine gums and then you kind of go up the dip and actually it's like maybe it's okay and it starts to work and actually i quite like it in fact actually it's a great success and it's sort of seeing yourself knowing that that dip will happen um so that you know how to kind of navigate the sort of pattern of that creative dip that's something that that helped me um I think uh, public speaking for me was really hard, really, really. Hard. I could never have done this many years ago. Um, and actually, I, I spoke to someone who did a, a training called Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Program Anya, Programming. Is, is, do you uh, name him in the book? Yes, I do. Yeah. Because yeah. I, um, I think that's a really useful resource for people. For, yeah. For yeah. And so I think sometimes if you have something you're scared of, don't be scared or, or embarrassed to actually find someone who's an expert, because in one session with him, and he's, as I say, his name's in the book, um, 
he literally turned me around from from not being able to even talk to my company um, to being able to stand up in front of an audience, which I, I, I honestly I would have bet a million pounds could never have happened. So, so I think it's about you know facing those doubts. Um, uh, other doubts that I've faced, I mean, so many. I'm just trying to think where to start. Um, I mean, I think there's so many doubts as you know as a, as a mum as well, and, and trying to be a mother uh, in the workplace and trying to balance family and 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 children and um, and finding your way through that. And actually, a piece of advice my mother-in-law gave me in fact the only piece of advice she ever gave me um was um if you're happy your children are happy and i thought it was a very generous piece of advice not only because it was the only piece of advice but um also because actually it's true that i think your children are happier if they have a sort of fulfilled if they have fulfilled parents around them and um, that bleeds into the kind of family moods i think that's important i could go on and on there's so many <laughs> Um, get the book they're all in there and yeah it really it really is a useful book question from sarah harding um it, it was about where you've gone to for help i don't and i don't think she just means sort of people who help you to public speak but organizations for support or when you found the going tough I mean, how does one even find those? Mm, mm. Well, I talk about them a lot. I think, um, you know, I think there's several areas. There's there's parenting. There's there's you and your your well being. Um, <laughs> there's um, there's business sort of help and mentoring. And I think you've got to find your own sort of support group. So that might be someone who. Um, I mean, I went to, once went to see an acupuncturist when I was really exhausted and he gave me some great advice. He said, um, you know, what's the problem? And I reeled off all my many, many problems, I thought. And he said, well, you chose every single one of those. And yeah. it, was, it was such a, much of it was helpful or not. I think it was incredibly helpful, actually, because it was just that mirror of you decided to be busy. So you've got to find a way to manage this. And, and that's um, obviously what you, what you feel comfortable with. Even though you're uncomfortable with it as well. well. I, it, but it has its price. So, you know, it was, it was just a lovely mirror held up, kind of going, don't complain, either change it or or find a way to manage it. So putting a team of of, of people that might be someone that you perhaps also has a business that um, you meet uh, once a month, perhaps in an unrelated sector, and you just sort of download to them your problems. I'm sure they're very similar problems. It might be about managing a workforce or, you know, incentive schemes, or it might be about supply chains or all those sorts of things. And actually just sharing that and having a sort of you know a sort of lean lean um sort of support so find your team and and use them and and um and you know th that's a really important thing i think to, to growing business people outside and, of your organization and yeah what was the smartest decision you made very early on that that can you look back and pinpoint something that really helped cement your business because obviously doing the bag for harper's bazaar that was fluky in a way it's following that up isn't it I think it's, I mean, I, I think it's about, you know, as I said, not giving up. I think it's getting started, that first big decision. And it's full of fear because you don't know, and especially if, if you're giving up a job and you're, you've got, you know, all the mortgage commitments and things everyone always has, that's sort of quite scary. So uh, I think that first step is, is, a, is a big one. And I think it's then when the going gets tough, not giving up then and just leaning into it. It's that creative dip um, that you have. And that applies to, to business dip as well. So it's really about at that point, not giving up, but actually going, I wanted to do this. Come on, let's just, let's dig in and, and find the way through. Um, but lots of breaks along the way and lots of, you know, interesting things. I mean, it's all about great people as well. I mean, I'm the luckiest woman ever because I'm surrounded by the best team. Uh, and I feel so completely, completely grateful for that, you know, so it, it doesn't feel lonely. I remember the first day I got my very first employee who's actually just come back to work for me, which is really lovely now. Um, and, um, you know, that first, that first day of saying good morning to someone and having a cup of coffee was so exciting after years of being on my own so so lots and lots of different lots of different things um an interesting question here from gabrielle brown is um how important is it to have a very clear idea well you think obviously very important but then she says or or, or as opposed to being a bit let's see how it goes I think it's both, honestly. I think that with any business, you start off with a clear idea and you need to be able to communicate that clearly to, to your customers, your future customers. So that needs to be clear. Um, but then you need to absolutely adapt. People who stick to their idea, when actually it's, it's not that part of the idea that's working, getting traction, tend to not do as well as people who, who, are, you know, who are flexible. So I think that's, that's really very important. Um, so, so, yeah, do bend. Um. Sorry, there's so many questions. Um, 
How have you balanced growing your business and reaching for commercial success while staying true to your values? I just want to put that in a bit of context because you recently bought back your business because you had sold part of it and you were on track to become really huge. And I think I, I may have misconstrued this, but you've decided you want to be this certain size with you in control. You know, I, how, I think I think the thing is that um, there's there's actually it's not so much I, when I bought back the business it's because I, I I found I didn't like not running my own business um, but I think that it's actually it's not so much about being a different size it's about growing the business differently so I think that bricks and mortar is is no longer so modern uh, it needs a very fresh approach hence the village and this very creative um, uh, sort of fun place for us to explore different um, projects um, but you can grow your business aggressively even actually um, through uh, through digital distribution and through um, connections with other people mm -hmm. in different parts of the world so uh, I don't think that's a, that's a choice but I think um, it, you know, you you it, 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 you can absolutely grow a business, and you can um, keep the culture and keep your values. I don't think the two things, if that's what the question is, I don't think the two things have to um, be separated. Once someone, once someone once accused me, it was a rather weird meeting where um, I was uh, talking about something which was actually not not fair and it went against something that had been agreed. And I I was uh, had a word afterwards, and, and I said, yeah, that wasn't quite right. And the person said to me, um, you must take the emotion out of this. Um, and that was such a wonderful moment because I realized that actually, no, emotion is what us entrepreneurs and perhaps, dare I say it, women do unbelievably well. That is our superpower. And we should actually never take the emotion out of it. A, a, running a business is all about emotions, about people, connections, uh, passion for product. Um, and I think some of our female traits we should really embrace, actually, uh, and realize that's, that's what makes us hopefully good. Annie, I'm going to sneak in one last question. You're going to have to answer it in about 15 seconds, but it's another really goodie um, from Prisha. And it's about how do you strike the balance between all the advice that everybody always wants to give you and some of it brilliant and, and just sticking, staying with what you believe to be true? Just stay with what you believe to be true. I really think you, you've got to drive this. You can't run a business by committee, unfortunately. So stick, I mean, of course, take all the the the, the advice. My husband always says I. I always ask his advice and never listen. So there you go. That's how I, that's how I roll. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'm getting gestured at. We're going to have to end that. We could have gone on for ages. Thank you all for your questions. And Anya, thank you so much. That's you always make question. me want to become a businesswoman. <laughs> <laughs> come, come, join us. <laughs> <laughs> and there's going to be plenty more happening during the day. Um, and um, well, thank you again for joining us.